is. And then he said he's going to talk about as it relates to speech, actions, the heart, and wealth. And we went through speech. It was about how to speak to them uh, and all of the various narrations taken from the Quran, the understanding of the, 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 the early generations. And then he went into how to respect them in according to the body. And he said that not walking in front of them, we discussed that and the exceptions to that rule, <clears throat> and advice on how to apply that with our children, especially when they rush into the house uh, or you know you come to the masjid and they just you know dart and just run off. And especially if it's like a dark parking lot and there's how many of you have our parents and you see your kids just dart off and you you know there's cars moving around. So even in those situations, walking behind you might be more beneficial. Um, there's, a, there's a video that went viral a couple of years ago of a gorilla, a troop of gorillas that were traveling in a jungle and they came out to where there was a road and there was a number of cars and the, the, the silverback, the, the, the father of the, 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 the troop, he kind of looked out of the, the, the jungle, he walked out, he stood in the middle of the road and these creatures are very big, um, taller than a lot of men would if they stand up and then out comes his whole troop, like 20, it was like a a bunch of adults and then kids and then he just stood in the road looking making sure that the car is on both sides and then once everybody had crossed over the road then he just he looked and then he walked he walked back uh, and so you know even in the animal kingdom that idea of the men being the protectors of the, the families we see that <clears throat> so when you as the parents you know you're you're making that d d d decision on when they're walking in front of you, when they're walking behind you, when you want to keep an eye on them, but at the same time also remembering that there's an etiquette of how they should be around you. Then he talked about the orders, and if your parents order you to do something, when you have to obey them and when you don't have to obey them. And one of the principles was, if it's not haram or harmful. So if, the or, if they tell you to do something, if they ask you to do something and it's haram, of course we don't obey, but we decline respectfully. And if they order us to do something that's harmful or unreasonable, and we went through examples of that. And then we ended on the principle of what happens if your parents order you to do something, but it goes against the adab, the etiquette of how you should be with them. And I mentioned two stories from the Sahaba, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Ali, where the Prophet ﷺ had ordered them and it went against the adab. The other proof of that we follow the order over the adab is actually found in the tashahud. So normally when we mention the name of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is the etiquette of mentioning his name? What are some of the etiquettes? Salawat. Salawat, saying salawat, what else? Sayyiduna. Sayyiduna Muhammad, saying our master Muhammad, or what else? If we say Muhammad, we should say Sayyiduna Muhammad, or if we don't say Muhammad, we say Rasulullah, Nabiullah, Habibullah, one of the honorific titles that we refer him to. So that he's not just treated as like some random person and you know. And sometimes, have you ever heard people just refer to the Prophet ﷺ as just by his first name and just kind of, and they don't put the salawat and they don't put a title. And it's like, who are you talking about? Your neighbor? You know, your younger brother? Are you talking about your younger brother Muhammad? Your neighbor Muhammad? The shopkeeper Muhammad? Or are you talking about Rasulullah? If you're talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, add that honorific title. But one of the proofs that we actually go with the order over the adab is in the is in the tashahhud of the prayer. So think about the tashahhud of the prayer. Did you get there? Right. <laughs> Right? We, we, we do the shahada. But we don't say Sayyiduna Muhammad Rasulullah. And in the shahada, we don't say, you know, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Sayyidana Muhammad al Abduhu wa Rasuluh. Which is true. It's linguistically it would work. Theologically it, it would work. But is that the way the Prophet ordered us to say the shahada? And how, is that the way that he taught us how to say the tashahada? And is that how the shahada is presented in the Qur'an? So here we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us the formula that we should use, or an order. The Prophet sallallahu giving us the shahada, the, the tashahud. 
but we drop the, the Sayyiduna in that situation. So that's a proof that some of the scholars said, well, in certain situations, even the, 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 the order overrides the Eden. So this is a, it's a fine point, but you can utilize it in your, in your interaction with your parents. If they ask you to do something, but you just feel like, I know you're telling me to do this, but I just don't feel like it's, it's proper, it's not respectful of you. Um, the same thing for your children. Be conscious of that because they might be um, in this situation. After I went through this text one time, what we went through the section of obeying your parents, and then he's going to talk about even sitting down before your parents, eating before your parents, that the edab is that you should not start eating until your parents have started eating. You should not sit down until they've sit down. So one student, he said his mother made him some food. And she gave him the plate and said, go sit down and start eating. And so he sat down at the, or he stood by the table and he stood up. She, and she looked over and she's still preparing other things for the meal. And she said, why aren't you starting to eat? And he said, well, because the edem, the etiquette, is that I should not sit down. I learned from my teacher after studying this book. The etiquette is that I should not sit down before you sit down. And I should not eat before you eat. She said, yes, but I'm, t I'm, I'm giving you an order to, to eat. And so then he went ahead and eat. And I, and I explained to him, I said, that's when I told him about this discussion of the order and the edab. So he was following the edab in that situation, and the mother was following the order, but what she wanted in that was the person, was the child to follow the order. Uh, and we, for those of us who have been in parents, you know that brush situation where you might tell your child to do something, and they say, well, I, you know, I want you to eat. I want to eat with the family. I, want to, I, I don't want to sit down. You know, they might start mentioning the edip. They want to follow the edip. And that's a good sign. That's a sign that you as the parent have actually instilled in them that etiquette, that they can have this uh, attention to details and to subtle things. In fact, some of the, the ulama, when they, they looked at edip, like if somebody were to say, what is edip in, this, in the tradition of Islam? When we say, you know, have adab, maintain adab, do adab, what exactly is adab? And some people might list out, you know, adab is this and adab is that. Others say, no, adab is actually a medica, which means it, it's, a, it's an expertise or a second nature that you develop. And so after, after working on something time and time and time again, eventually it becomes part of you and you might be in a situation where you feel something is right or something is wrong. You don't have an exact understanding of what, you can't put your finger on it, but you feel this is the right thing to do. And so that's one of the, the concepts of Edith, that you're in a situation you feel, okay, I understand the ruling, I understand what we, we have to do in this, so we're not going to compromise on our religion, but what would be the proper way of presenting this ruling or applying this ruling in this situation? That, that deep connection to, uh, to the deen is Edith. <clears throat> then Sheikh Muhammad Maloud mentions that if your parents tell you to do an act of worship, not a wajib, but an extra act of worship, that at that time it actually becomes an obligation. And this is a very interesting hukum. That according to many of the fuqaha, if they tell you, okay, I want you to go pray your sunnahs. How many of you are, who are parents and you have to tell your kids, I want you to pray your sunnahs? Well, it's just sunnah, right? Well, when you tell them to pray, it's, to pray the sunnah, it actually becomes an obligation because by not doing it, they're bothering you. And we're going through this whole science of not bothering the parents and honoring the parents as long as it's within reason. If the parents tell you, oh, I want you to get up and pray two hours of tahajjud, is that reasonable? No. Two rak'ahs before asr, a few, two rak'ahs before dhuhr, two after maghrib, that's reasonable because even, especially the way children pray, only take about 30 seconds or a minute, right? Um, but the same applies also to us as adults. If our parents ask us to do something, and it's an act of worship, and it's not going to harm us, it's not going to take us out, you know, it's not going to be unreasonable for us to try to do this, then that actually could become a, an obligation. So he says, in Amarabi ba'atin wajibati bil karahati. Another interesting thing is that if they tell us to do something makru, that it actually becomes wajib to do. And not the makru that's a sin, but a makru would be something like, um, say for example, if a person is going out of the, the, the house to the, to the masjid to attend the, 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 the prayer in jama'ah. It's sunnah to attend the masjid in jama'ah. If a person is able to attend the, the masjid in jama'ah, 
and does not go, it's makru, it's dislike. It's dislike to pray on your own when you have the ease and the opportunity to pray with a jama'ah. Well, what if somebody's walking out of the house and the mother says, no, 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 stay here, please, please, just stay here. You know, you pray the Dhuhr on your own and just stay here. Finish, you know, uh, have a meal with me, have some tea with me or something. And he, a person in that situation might say, oh, wait a minute, this is the salah, this is the jama'ah, this is praying in congregation, praying in the masjid. You know, it's so important, which is all true. If you look at the way the Prophet wasallam, how he established the jama'ah in the early generation, it was true. It was very, very, it was core and it was essential. They would actually look at the jama'ah and the people who not, are not there, what did they think about them? They're sick. What's that? They're sick. It, well, they, they, they might think they're sick, but the people who regularly did not attend the jama'ah. Hypocrites, munafiqun. It was one of the signs of the munafiqin. They didn't come to the jama'ah a lot if they could avoid it. And if they did come, they came just kind of like walking slowly. And then when they get to the prayer, it's just kind of like lazily. Whereas the sahaba, a lot of them were running to the jama'ah to the point that one sahaba, one time he came into the masjid and he was, ah, we've all seen the brothers that come to the masjid like running, right? We also know the, the brothers and maybe even sisters who double park and park in the red zones. Every masjid has that issue, right? Parking in, illegally parking to get to the jama'ah. Um, and so the Prophet ﷺ addressed that. He said, if you come to the jama'ah, come and you have sakina and waqar about you. Have, have uh, tranquility and dignity. So don't come rushing. So even though it's important to pray, and he said if people understood the, the ejab that is in the jama'ah prayer, the isha prayer, they would have come what? How would have they come to the prayer? Hadwa, crawling. They would have crawled. So he's telling them, come to the prayer, even if you have to crawl. And when they start running, no, 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 hold on a second. Okay, it's important to come, but come with the adab, the etiquette. So yes, here's a sunnah, but there's an etiquette, there's an adab in, in coming to uh, the, the love and desire for certain acts of worship override other elements of the sunnah. We have to look at the sunnah. So. If we're running to the jama'ah, that's not, if we're, we're not, we're not following a sunnah to reach a sunnah. If we're illegally parking to get to the jama'ah, if we're double parking and blocking somebody in, at that point we're actually doing something haram to get to the jama'ah. Yeah. And so this is the adab that's mentioned where if the parents tells a child, please I don't want you to attend the jama'ah, stay with me. Now this is normally makru, but they said, okay, well here's, here's a dilemma that we have. It's makru, the parent is telling you to do something makru, but upsetting them is what? Haram. So now we have to weigh out which is, what is the lesser of the two uh, um, harms in this situation? And they said, uh, go with what the parents want. Unless it becomes consistent. If the parents are always telling the children, no, 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 and there are some parents, once they start seeing, seeing their children become more observant, oh, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't grow a beard, you shouldn't wear hijab, you shouldn't go to the masjid. All of these things are, it's, it's a type of, if, if a person um, obeys whoever's telling them, whether it's a teacher, or whether it's a parent, or whether it's a, the, the, the government, they're saying, don't have this element of Islam, and don't have this element of Islam. They said this is a method of, of, of um, extinguishing the light of the sunnah and the sharia. Nobody has that right to do that. That's why for the people who are in that situation, the Qur'an has mandated hijrah. If you can't practice here in Mecca, go to Medina. And so hijrah has always been a part of our, of our deen, and one of it is so that we can have the sha'air of, of the deen. We can have these outward symbols of the deen. So nobody, including the parent, have the right to change that. But once in a while, if they ask us to do something that might be disliked, we shouldn't like... Uh, allow a type of arrogance to say, how dare you tell me to do something makru? No, understand that the, the ulama have said, for the parents specifically, and this is not something that's given to anybody else, that the harm of upsetting them and avoiding that overrides sometimes doing something that's makru, disliked. It's not a sin, it's, it's disliked. Um, an example of this one time, Imam Malik came into the masjid. And if we read about the story of Imam Malik, there's actually a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said that there will come a time when, when people will beat the livers of their camels, meaning they'll travel like very hard. Sharqan wa gharban, they'll go east and west and they will not find anybody more knowledgeable than Alim al-Madina, than the scholar of Medina. When Imam Malik came, 
They said, this is who the Prophet was talking about. Imam Malik was born in Medina. He was raised in Medina. He died in Medina. He only left Medina to make it the Hajj. He never rode an animal in Medina. If he had to ride an animal, he would take it outside of the city because he said, I don't want to be on an animal in the city of the Messenger of Allah He never wore his sandals in the city of the Prophet He, before he began teaching publicly, he got permission from 70, 70 of the highest scholars of Medina at the time. He had people who could, who could come to him and he, uh, and he studied with, he studied with Tabi'in who had studied with the Sahaba. So he was a very high level scholar. One of the four main, the, the four schools that have preserved uh, Islam, Sunni Islam is Imam Malik. Now imagine his, I'm just prefacing that to see like, now he walks into the masjid and he walks in after Asr and he sits down and a random person from Medina, some say it was even a child, says, you need to pray uh, Tahiyyat to masjid this is Imam Malik, one of the preservers of the Sunnah. If somebody knows the Sunnah, he knows the Sunnah. And according to him, that the Tahiyyatul Masjid is makru after Nawafil is makru after Asad, even the Tahiyyah of the Masjid. So he sat down. Well, when this person, when this um, um, just average person from the city told Imam Malik to, 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 do, to, to pray, he stood up and prayed two rakahs. So even though he says it's makru to pray after Asad, even if it's the Hayyat al Masjid. This person says, why didn't you pray? And he gets up and pray. Why did he do that? He's not being hypocritical, but people want to know, why did you do that? So somebody asked him, they said, why did you do that? He said, because in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا يَرْكَعُونَ And when it is said to them, meaning the disbelievers, irka, you know, pray, they don't pray. He said, and I didn't want to be from those people. So somebody just told me pray, and it wasn't a time that's haram. He's like, well, so he's looking at two different things. He said, according to this, his understanding of the sunnah, that's actually dislike to do. But at the same time, the Quran is talking about a general principle of one of the descriptions of the disbelievers is that when they are told to prostrate, to actually to do rukur, meaning to pray, they don't pray, and I don't want to be from amongst them. So how many times have we been in situations where Something may be permissible according to the Sharia, but there's just something where like, ah, I can't, I can't do that. Like my, my adab about this matter, I can't do that. An example that comes to mind right now is um, the halal bacon that has become very popular, right? Anybody know Muslims here that are like, I don't care if it's halal, you know, slaughtered by the most righteous person on the face of this earth. I'm not eating halal bacon. Anybody know like uh, Muslims who won't eat halal bacon? Yeah? And one of the reasons is, is because there's like, it's just so similar to what we're not supposed to be eating. Um, and so it's not that it's haram, it's just that this person's edem, their etiquette is not allowing them to, to do that. Um, so then, then Muhammad Maulud says um, also about the regular sunnas, the, the, the parents have no, um, they don't have any right to, get, to tell a child to stop them. So the regular sunnas, they should be established individually by the community and nobody has a right to stop them. And this is important too because sometimes again, uh, when, pa when, when people start practicing their faith, parents might say, oh, I don't want you to do that. And so this happens like, as I mentioned, sometimes it's with a beard, sometimes with a kufi, sometimes with a hijab, some, sometimes with praying, sometimes with praying in public. What if somebody says, oh, I, I want to pray in public and the parents like, no, 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 don't pray in public. And so it might cause him to delay the, the prayer out of its out of its the first time, or they say, "I don't want you. I don't want you to be so um, uh, outward about your faith." And so, yes, we respect the parents, but at the same time, we cannot allow them to cause elements of the deen to be uh, extinguished. And then I'll just end in the, this last uh, section and I'll open it up for questions. And then, uh, uh, <clears throat> so now he discusses an interesting point which is about Sefa traveling without the permission of the parents and if you remember in the discussion of, of uh, Juraj the monk from Bani Israel who was praying and he had to make the choice between prayer or answering his mother and he went on with the prayer and she made dua against him one of the the things that Imam Noah mentions that we take from this hadith is the prohibition of traveling without permission of the parents so Muhammad Maulud says, 
don't travel in a permissible trip or even at a recommended trip except if they if they accept uh, unless they accept for you to travel so this could be going out of the house if it could also be going to um, just taking a, a drive around if it's something that they don't want and again it's reasonable it's not like you know sometimes some parents want to just smother their child and, no don't go and I always want to be around you no that's not that's not reasonable when we're talking about a reasonable request if they say I don't want you to travel then it would be an obligation according to some scholars that we <coughs> that we follow them for some people once they're in adulthood this may be an issue that they're facing with their parents but this is also something that we should remember as we're raising our children that as they're now starting to leave and go out with their friends and wanting to do activities that we do have a right as parents to limit that freedom. So it's not just about, oh, I don't want to limit his freedom and he or she can go out and do whatever they want. At the same time, we don't want to smother them and become like helicopter parents and, and, and hovering around them to not give them any freedom. So we have to be able to strike a balance based on understanding the child and the situation that they're asking to be in. And sometimes you might be in a situation where two of your own children, you're giving more freedom to one of your children than the other than the other because you feel that they're more mature and they would be able to um, make the right decisions and the right choices in uh, situations that you the, the, that people might make the wrong decision they go out with their friends and um, the, they leave the house for a few hours or even overnight you might allow some you might allow others or you might not allow others and this is the decision that you're making as the parents um, you have to be careful that they don't feel that it's inequality. We also know from the Sunnah, the Prophet وسلم, said to, to make sure that you're equal, that you treat your children equally, even in, what did he say? He said, treat them equally and give them things evenly, evenly, even in kissing them. Even in kissing them. So sometimes, you know, you might hug a younger child if you have a number of children like, how can we don't get that, you know? So the Prophet ﷺ knew what he was talking about ﷺ. He knew that children have this, when they see one child getting loved or kissed more, that it could cause enmity with the other one. So he's teaching us even if you give this one five kisses, make sure you give the other one five kisses as well. When you give out, when you give them gifts, make sure you're, you're trying to be as, as equal and fair as possible. And this hadith actually has been taken to the point of um, um, you know, it's not just when you're thinking about candy. It's like also if you're if you have wealth and you're starting to distribute some of your wealth to your adult children, then you have to you know be equal amongst them, be equal amongst the children. So the parents have a right to to tell the child not to travel, and that's if it's permissible, just like a regular a regular trip. But what if it's a trip to go and seek knowledge? He says, if it's a trip to go and seek knowledge, then you have to look. Is there anybody in your local area who can teach you? And if there's not, and the only way to study your deen is you have to travel, which in, uh, traditionally was called a rihla. So rihla means now, what do, what do the modern Arabs use rihla as? Just a vacation, going on a rihla. But traditionally, rihla was the adventure or the trip that a Muslim made to go and seek knowledge. And they would go to far extents to, to, seek, to seek this knowledge. And it was not just about studying with people, it was also about taking from their adab, taking from their character, taking from their example. Imam Malik, before he would go to his lesson, his mother, as a young child, his mother would tell him, when you go to your teacher, learn adab before you learn his ilm. Learn his, his character and his etiquette be, before, his, uh, uh, before his knowledge. Take from his adab before his, before his men. Yes? So, where it says that you need to take permission from your parents, does it mean that every time you step out, then you take permission? Oh, or, good, or good question. Yeah, yeah, so the, the question is that when you, when you have to take permission from your parents, does it mean that every single time you have to ask permission from your parents? And the answer is no. You don't have to literally, you know, like... Um, like a military style or prison style, go and you know get permit, permission to leave the, the compound, permission to leave the residence. That's not what it's talking about. It's just talking about you. You, you eventually you know when, when what type of uh, leaving of the house they would like or what they wouldn't like. Um, 
you know, if you leave and they're, um, they're asleep, you know, but you might leave a note. Or sometimes people might say, okay, I didn't want to, I had to go shopping, but I waited for my mother and my father to finish praying so I could let them know that. Or I waited for them to wake up so I could let them know, know that. Or um, when I left the house, I sent a text message or I wrote something. But just something to let them know that this is not like, um, you know, this is not like a hotel. Because a hotel, you go and come as you please. You don't have to ask anybody. You go to you go to your work, you know, unless you're punching in and punching out. You know, you go inside your work and you leave. And you don't have to tell somebody, hey, I'm, well, I, unless some, some, some managers or some bosses want to know. But... To take the example of a hotel. Hotel, you don't have to tell the people you're going or you're coming. So it's it's just to show your parents that you, the, 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 the relationship that I have with you is is you're not just any house. You're somebody that I respect. Or if we think of, a, of a, like a guest, if you go to somebody's house, a host, and you leave without letting the host know, think of how they would feel or how you would feel if you were the host. And these are your parents who hosted you for years and years before you could even walk and talk and take care of yourself. Um, or if you, um, you know, the, the etiquette of, um, of um, leaving Mecca. What is, what is one of the etiquettes of leaving Mecca when you go to uh, Hajj, for example? You have to waffle ifada once you finish it, and then what? At the end, before you go home. Waffle wada. What does wada mean? Bye. So we don't just leave the Kaaba. Now, at the same time, we don't go, uh, have you ever seen people walk out of the Kaaba and they walk backwards because they don't want to turn their back to the Kaaba? So they said that's not according to the Sunnah. But some people do it because they just feel like, oh, I, I don't want to turn my back to the Kaaba. So they develop that, but it's, it's, it's considered a, 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 an innovation. It's not something that's from the, 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 the actions of the Prophet وسلم, in leaving the, the Kaaba. The leaving of the Kaaba is you do tawaf and wada and then you leave. So we don't treat it like any other uh, masjid. I mean, this masjid, there's an etiquette of coming to the masjid, right? But is there a prayer that we have to do to leave the masjid? There's not. But Mecca has a special <coughs> status. So in the same way with our parents, we don't just leave without letting them know. We let them know we, we respect you, your, your feelings. We don't want you to, you know, get up from a nap and you look around and you're like, oh, where's my son, where's my daughter? I left a note, I told you, or you know, I, I let you know before. So to, 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 to bring up that level of, of, uh, of respectful interaction. But if you know that the parents are okay, then you don't have, they don't have to, so if you have children, say for example, in high school or college, and you know, okay, they leave to school at eight in the morning, you know, and, 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 you, and they know, and you know, and it's an understanding between, then you don't have to ask. And again, this is not a hukum shari, like a, a sharia ruling where you have to ask before they leave every single time. It's just the, 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 under, the, the idea that you don't make the going and the coming with your parents like the going and the coming with, 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 with strangers. So he says, if, if you have to seek knowledge and your parents are telling you don't travel, you can disobey them. Um, if you have to go to hajj, and they're like, oh, don't go to hajj, uh, for whatever reason. You can disobey them. Um, if a person has to find a, a, a job, if it's difficult in their locale to find a job, to further their career, to study, if there are things that are necessities of life, well, the parents can't prevent a person from following the necessities of life. But we start with the understanding that the baseline ruling is that my goings and coming, even as an adult, are re respect to the parent. That's, that's the baseline. And I, uh, I ask their permission. That's the baseline, asking their permission. But if it gets, if it gets unreasonable, then we don't, uh, we don't have to follow their, their request. Before I get into the financial support of the parents, do we have any questions on um, the, or, or comments about the, the bid as it relates to our body, walking, sitting? Oh, uh, also he mentions, I mentioned it, but he says, don't sit. Uh, in a place that's better or higher than your parents. And also when you come to, to, uh, to sit, he mentions here an, a, a point of adab that you should ask permission to be seated and permission to leave from your parents. Now a lot of cultures today, I don't think most cultures have this where they, it's actually part of the culture. Even this book where it was written in West Africa and Mauritania, they don't have that culture. The people don't have where they'll ask the parents, oh, may I have permission to be seated, may I have a seat, may I leave, and so forth. Um, and I know one person who tried it here and the parent got annoyed because it's not part of our culture. 
And I mean, is there any culture here where where they where they have where you've seen that where the the child actually asks from the parent, "May I have a seat? You know, and may I leave?" I know in the, in, the, in America a long time ago they would say, "Can I can I leave the table? May I may I leave the table?" Yeah, no, that, that's, that's what you were gonna ask. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that too. Like in, in Spanish, too, like they would say, "If you're about to leave, if you're about to get out from the table, for sure you definitely for the table." Compromiso like, with permission. To oh, okay. How do you say it? Compromiso with Compromiso? Okay. Yeah. So even now at the table in Spanish culture, you ask permission to leave. Yeah, yeah. Anytime you're kind of even when you're like leaving, uh, like a, a group. Yeah, especially with your parents. Yeah. Okay. So we do have that. So still. Yeah. And if the parents something that's like from the etiquette of the culture, and our dean is saying to do it, then yeah, definitely. Then now a person has more emphasis, like more uh, motivation to do it because now it's also in the dean. But if somebody comes from a culture where it's like, okay, come on, you don't have to ask me, you know, going and leaving every single time. Um, uh, so, some people will, will, before they leave, like in the presence of a teacher, they'll say, este dino income. Um, has anybody ever heard that from the Arab cultures with the parents? Before they leave the parents? Mm -hmm. Or any other, basically like, uh, con permiso, the, with permission, permission to leave. In Pakistan? Do they have anything that they say specifically? It's like a ijazat. Ijazat, okay, yes, yeah. You know, may I leave? May I leave, yeah. And I think, I mean, uh, one of the things that happens in modern societies is we're losing a lot of etiquettes. And so this might be something that, you know, with somewhere within our life, we don't know where it's going to be within our individual households, that we try to bring a certain level of etiquette so that we can have some traditions that, that are passed on. That, like, for example, one tradition that I really like in the, the, uh, the, the Daisy cultures is the older brother, they refer to him as Bai, right? And the older sister is um, Api? Api, yeah. So, um, Appa, okay. So they have a specific name for the older brother or the older sister. And I think that's good because even in our deen, the Prophet Sallallahu he said, the oldest brother is like the father. You know, so the idea that the eldest is, um, uh, is, is, is owed a little bit more respect. So if we have that ingrained into our culture, that's something that's good. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so then, then um, Sheikh Muhammad Maroud mentions that, um, now, when it comes to financial support. Now, again, some people may be naturally inclined, and they're just generous people, and they want to support their parents, and they don't, they don't count. Um, and uh, that's one of the things that I learned from, um, from, from seeing people who, who, who I know were generous, they don't count. They're not counting the money. They're just, they're giving. It's not, it's a difference between being wasteful. It's not about being wasteful. It's just, they're generous and they're not nitpicking and like counting the pennies or pennies. One, uh, one of the students here, uh, I said pin, I'm talking about the writing pin, but it should be pronounced pen. So I'm working on my distinction between the pen and the penny. Uh, pennies, uh, you know, we're not counting, we're not going to count pennies. We should, we should be uh, generous. And so if, a, and the person that we should be most, or the people we should be most generous, generous with are our parents. Especially because when we needed it, they weren't sitting there counting pennies. They were, uh, medicine, buy it. Food, buy it. Diapers, buy it. Clothes, buy it. Clothes are too small, buy it. How many of you buy it? Well, buy them some, you know, and it's not like, oh, well, you know what, you're gonna fit into those shoes even if it, you know, gives you blisters on your feet. That's not the way the average parent is with their child. So that's the way we are with our children. That's the way our parents were with us, generous, generous, being generous. So now when it comes time for the generosity, the generosity to be recipro reciprocated, and now we pay it forward, give it to our parents, we should also be generous. So if a person's generous, we don't have to get into all of these rules of, well, how much do I actually owe my parents? You see what I'm saying? It's like uh, the same thing in a marriage. If a, if, a, if a person comes to an imam or a sheikh, and he asks a question, well, how much do I actually have to financially support my wife with? That's not the sign of a good marriage. Now we can answer, we say, well, here's the bare minimum. And the bare minimum is not, I'll tell you what the bare minimum is. In clothing, it's two outfits a year. One for the winter, 
one for the summer and the spring. Now you tell me, is any marriage <laughs> going to work with that? Honey, I'll, I'll, it's just uh, the fun, this, uh, all the fun of the fun. And she's going to say, oh yeah? You want to just talk about bare minimum fun? Okay, let's make this a bare minimum uh, relationship. It's not going to work. And so these rules that we're about to go over, which is what is the bare minimum in terms of giving to your parents, we're just, it's just, it's good to know the baseline. It's good to know, like in a marriage, yes, the financial obligation is upon the husband to the wife. And so he's always motivated, like this is part of my deem to spend on my family. But at the same time, the wife should also remember in her mind, like his basic obligation is nowhere near what the custom dictates to the people. So if my husband is not choosing to spend on this, that, or the other, he's not doing anything haram. And I shouldn't make it seem as if he's doing something haram. And at the same time, it's good for the husband to know, well, well my wife doesn't have to cook a lavish meal every, because if she says, oh, bare minimum, well, I'm just gonna boil you some wheat, right? Boil you some rice, I, have to, I wanna cook for you? Okay, I'm gonna do the bare minimum for you. And I'm not cooking for your children, because that's not an obligation on her. That shocks a lot of people. It's not a, she has to cook for the husband, not for the children, and not for his guests. So all those Ramadan feasts that the mom does, she doesn't have to do those. The pickups and drop-offs from school, mom doesn't have to do those. Now, I'm not trying to, you know, like, liberalism and feminism and like, you know, all right, sisters, stop. No, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about, if they start going, if the marriage starts going tit for tat, and what do, I, what do I have to do and what you have to do, that's not a healthy relationship. But it's good to know that down there at the bottom, there is a bare minimum. So that also when we're giving, we're giving um, generously and lovingly. And we know like, I don't have to do this, but I want to do this. And the wife is doing the same thing. You know, I don't have to do this, but I, and I'm not going to make it a big contention in my relationship because that's not, you know, that's not the, um, the point of the marriage. This is not like some... Uh, cut for love, they'll talk about kitab and sunnah, and so forth, so I'm going to do extra. So now when it comes to the parents, it is a financial, uh, it is an obligation upon children to financially support their parents. It's an obligation. But there's a few conditions to that. So one of the things they mention is that, well, what if the parent is actually able to work, but chooses not to? Because a lot of Muslims, they say, well, our, my 401k plan is my kids. Well, that's my retirement plan. And as soon as they start working, man, you know, okay, I'm, I'm going to cash in on my stocks and bonds and 401k plan and all that, my kids. And they're going to work and they're going to support me. I'm going to live with my, in my kids' house. I'm going to take from their salary and so forth. So the, the, the Fuqaha said, mm, that's not what it means. The obligation of the child to support the parent is only when the parent is not able to provide for themselves. So this also creates a strong work ethic in the Muslim. The strong work ethic is I'm going to work as long as, long as, I, have, as long as I can, I'm going to work. And I'm going to, even if I have to support myself by the sweat of my brow, I'm going to do it. And if my son wants to help me out, alhamdulillah, but I'm out there, I'm going to be uh, working, self-sufficient, <coughs> self-reliant, and so forth. But when it comes time for them, they have a need, who are the people that are obligated to support them? Their children. That's one point. The other point is, well, who amongst the children is it an obligation upon if they have multiple children? So there's three opinions. One says it's just the boys, just the men in the family. And this makes sense from the idea of الرِّجَالُ قَوَّمُنْ عَلَى النِّسَاء If we're going to tell the women, you don't have to work to support your husband and your children. That's his job. Then why are we going to tell the women you have to support your parents? It's on, it's on the men. The other opinion is, well, and again, there's nothing clear from the uh, directives of the, the Sunnah of the Prophet, uh, the, 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 the words, direct words of the Prophet addressing this. So all we have is ijtihad. We have educated um, estimations. I'm not even going to say a guess. They're taking a principle, which the principle is men support the families. Well, let's apply that over here to the parents. It's the men in the family. The other opinion is that, well, we look at the inheritance. Girls have a right to inheritance. And so if they have a right to the parents' inheritance, then they also, that comes up with an obligation that when the parents are in financial need, the girls should support as well. But they said, on that opinion, they said, it goes according to the, um, uh, 
the inheritance rules. So if the, if the boys are getting two shares of the inheritance and the girls for every one share the girls get, the boys get two, two shares, well that's their financial obligation when it comes to uh, financial support of the parents. The third opinion is that it's equal upon, uh, among all the children. Okay, why do we mention all these opinions? Just to say it is an obligation. There's some difference of opinion on the details of how that's, uh, how that's done. But ultimately, when it comes time for a family to support their parents, it, it shouldn't get to this point. It shouldn't, sometimes it might. It might get to the point where people are like, well, how much are you giving and how much are, am I giving? But the best thing would be that they do whatever they're able to and their understanding of each other. If there's a, a girl in the family and she is wealthier than one of her brothers, she understands, well, even though there's not a fit, the, the, the fit supports he, that he has to give more than me, I'm gonna say out of the generosity of my own soul, I'm gonna give more because I understand my brother. And that's the etiquette of the, the, the akhlaq, the adab, the, the character that a person should, uh, should have. So that's in terms of who has to support the parents. The, then the question becomes, well, how much do we have to give the parents? And the, the general principle is that we have to support the parents according to the custom of, our, uh, of, uh, of the society that we live in to a point that they're not, they're, not, um, they're not feeling like they're wasting away. They're actually feeling like, so we don't have to give them a lavish lifestyle, but at the same time, we don't just have to say, well, here's bare minimum food, clothing, and housing to keep you alive. No, that's, not, that's also not what, what the dean is, 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 is teaching us. The dean is teaching us that we have to support them in a way that gives them a comfortable lifestyle. That's the best way to put it comfortable lifestyle. So um, so not lavish, and not bare minimum, but comfortable. Well, so, and as a proof of this, they said if the parents want new clothes for Eid, I mean, you might say like, who would make a big deal about this? But you'd be surprised, right? There are some people who's just, their miserliness will kick in, even with the people who are closest to them. And even though it should never kick in with the parents, of all, of all people, it should never kick in with the parents, their miserliness kicks in with the parents. And so they said, no, even if your parent asks for a new clothes for me, somebody says, well, he's got other outfits. Let him wear last year's outfit. No, you give him something. Because is it lavish to have a new clothes for Eid? No. Is it bare minimum? Can they wear last year's Eid clothes? Yeah. But is it comfortable to have new clothes? So that's the, that's the idea, that we, that we want our parents, we want to keep our parents at a comfortable level. The last point in this section he mentions, which is the last, Muhammad Maulud said, Bir, in speech, action, wealth, and then in heart. And so then he says, um, And I think this is probably one of the most difficult ones. We'll end here and answer any questions. But it's basically that, in addition to maintaining outward etiquette and adab and respect and honoring our parents, we also have to have it inwardly in our hearts. And this is taken from the understanding, as I mentioned earlier, the, the ayahs in Surah Al-Isra, which are very comprehensive about Bidr al 17, 23 to 25. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, it's, don't speak to them this way, and speak to them this way, and don't say uff, and be humble. At the end, he says, Rabbukum a'lamu bima fi nufusikum. Your Lord is more aware of what is in your heart. So after going through all of the outward etiquette, don't say uff. Make dua for them and don't uh, uh, don't uh, shout at them and don't say oof to them and all of the outward etiquettes and be humble. Then he says, and your Lord knows what's in your hearts. Meaning, even if you maintain the outward etiquettes with your parents, and we know people like this, right? In front of their parents, no, no, maybe, yeah, maybe. but if they get behind, they're like, oh, I cannot stand that man. So that person has in their heart both or hate for their parents, even though outwardly they're maintaining the etiquette. So if somebody comes and says, when you sit with your parents, I follow the rules. Financial, I follow the rules. Traveling, I follow the rules, I follow the rules. I follow everything outwardly. But in their heart, they have issues with their parents. He says, this is something that you have to get out of your heart. And this is very difficult. Um, if a person has something, especially if it's resentment, you know, sometimes maybe something that was not done or something that was done wrong from childhood. And one of the things that really, really hurts human beings is resentment. There's a very famous speaker now, and he's a, he's a, he's a clinical psychologist. 
And he said that a lot of problems in life, or everybody's problems in life, he says after 40 years of seeing thousands of patients in his clinical practice, he says, I've broken it down to three, three things. These are the three things that cause all problems in life. Arrogance, resentment, and deceit or treachery. And he also speaks a lot from, he's not a Muslim, he speaks from the Bible. And he says, these three elements are in the story of Iblis, the shaitan. Think about it. Arrogance and a khayrumin, right? I'm better than him. Um, resentment. Who was Iblis resentful against? Hmm? Adam, but ultimately, who? Allah. And he says, Bima avoitani. You're the one who did this to me. Speaking to Allah. You're the one who led me astray. And then treachery. What does Iblis say at the end of that story? He was arrogant against Adam, resentful. Then what does he say to him? Hmm? If you delay me, what is he going to do? I'm going to sit on the straight path. And I'm going to, you know, trick them and trap them and pull them down. Treachery. And so he says, now speaking from his clinical practice, he says these three things, if, you, if we have them in our life, arrogance, resentment, and, and, and deceit or treachery, it ruins everything. It ruins friendships, ruins businesses, ruins marriages, ruins relationships. And so the point that I was mentioning here is the resentment that we might have towards our parents. If we have resentment, it's not healthy. It's something the shaitan had at the very beginning, got him on a long road, a long road to hell. Uh, one of my students uh, who's in prison, he has life without parole. He's working on, a, a, on an innocence claim because there were some issues with his, um, the, the key witness actually came forth and he said, I lied. And they said, well, now we don't accept that he has life without parole. So he's in prison, he's helping a lot of people. And one of the things that he's doing is developing a 12 steps program to address alcohol and narcotics use uh, from an Islamic uh, lens. But one of the things that's very important, whether in addiction or any criminal behavior, and this goes for any of us who's struggling with a fault, struggling with doing something haram, is that we have to take responsibility for our actions. That's one of the main steps. Until we take responsibility for our actions, we're not going to be able to get past, uh, get past that. And so then he asked me a question today. He said, I heard that that the shaitan was given the opportunity that if he just takes responsibility for his actions, then he will be forgiven. And so I had a vague recollection of something. I looked it up. There is a hadith. It's considered da'if. Imam Suyuti mentions it in his tafsir, but he says it's, it's a da'if hadith. But listen to what it has, because it's still a hadith. Even though it's da'if, it's still a hadith. So he says the shaitan came to Musa salam, and he said, Musa, your Lord sent you as a messenger and spoke to you after you made toba. Now, granted, Imam uh, Musa alayhi salam, when he pushed the person and killed him, he didn't do it on purpose, right? He didn't realize his strength, the man fell, hit his head and so forth. But he made toba from that even so. So the Iblis said, you made toba from, your, from that and Allah chose you, Ustafaka, and he, um, he, he, he spoke to you. I'm going to ask you to intercede on my behalf, uh, you know, on my behalf to, to your Lord. And actually in the hadith he says, to my Lord. The Iblis says, ila rabbi, to my Lord, just to say, can he make tawbah for me? So, Musa alayhi uh, made dua and Allah sent him wahi. And um, Allah says, I, I responded to your call, Musa. So then Musa tells Iblis, he said, Allah responded. You just have to do one thing. What do you think it was? Hmm? Take responsibility. Take responsibility, but what? Like he actually asked, Allah asked him for an action. Prostrate. Well, Adam's not allowed alive, so what did he say? He says, go to where Adam and I will remind them of their wife and their children, and I'll make them retreat from the battlefield, which is one of the kabahir. And then he said, the third thing, he said, never be alone with a woman who's not your mahram, because I am your messenger to her, and I am her messenger to you. So he gave him these three pieces of advice. Basically, you did me a favor, thank you. You know, I didn't get what I wanted. Um, but my student asked me to look up this hadith because he said basically what's happening in this hadith is that the shaitan is still not taking responsibility like, for his actions. He was given a chance, but part of it was the resentment. So he's holding on, he's resentful, and now we have to look in our lives. If we're holding on to something resentful, whether it's to our parents or our spouse or our children or our friends or our neighbors or our siblings, 
If we're holding on to some resentment, we really have to figure out what that is and start working on letting it go. And that's what he's saying. Part of the bit is of uh, the, the 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 respect of the parents is to uh, to remove this from the hearts. Is Scott coming here? So we'll just wait. He's here. He's here. Okay. Um, so we'll end there. If there's any questions until the imam arrives for the salon. Yes. You mentioned the. Uh you know that uh, if girls have to also support uh, their parents, mm -hmm. uh, but if they are not obligated to work, uh, if they are married, then how could they? If they have wealth, this is all talking about. They have wealth. There's no no person who does not have wealth is ever forced to to work. So yeah. it's it's about uh, a person who has the wealth from whatever from whatever methods, and they do that.